Hi, Clutter Fairy fans. This is the Clutter Fairy Weekly for November 15th, 2022. I'm your co-host, Ed Gumnick, and I'm speaking with Gail Goddard, certified professional organizer and owner of the Clutter Fairy in Houston, Texas. Hi, everybody. The Clutter Fairy Weekly is the webcast and podcast that digs deep into the clutter that piles up between you and the life you want to be living. We explore the habits and behaviors that lead to clutter, and we su suggest strategies to slow the accumulation, reduce the collection, and comfortably manage the stuff we decide to keep. If you're new to our Zoom meeting, we'd like to let you know that you can share your comments and questions via the chat. And I'll try to make sure Gail gets to them before we move on to another topic. You can also use the raise hand feature if you'd like to ask a question or make a comment yourself via audio or video. We haven't as, had as much uh, participation in that form in recent weeks, so mm -hmm. we need y'all to step up. Come on, <laughs> talk to us. <laughs> We're also streaming the webcast live on Facebook, so you can share your questions and comments there, and I'll relay them to Gail. We're going to start as we usually do by recapping last week's weekly tittle, which was called Culling the Project Heard. The assignment was to evaluate unfinished projects to identify any that no longer uh, deserve to be taking up space in your home and your head. We'd like to hear from our participants live in Zoom and Facebook. Who diagnosed a project or two that they were ready to let go this week? Please let us know in the comments. Here's a report we, we received on the show notes post for last week's episode from Anna S. in Sweden, who's been giving us lots of great comments. What great advice to make an inventory of all projects. I wrote down all my projects and categorized them from one, yay, to four, what was I thinking? <laughs> Using the questions you suggested. I have now donated the materials for the two projects that scored a four. I also made an appointment with myself in six months time to go through my list and ask myself the same questions again. It will be an opportunity to see how many projects I actually get done in half a year. I have made a promise to myself not to start anything until I have finished all my pro all projects on my list. I so needed this. Great job setting an appointment with yourself to circle back. I thought that was really clever and it creates you know, that artificial deadline. I had actually thought about making that an, a, a, another bullet point on last week's tittle, which was pl plan a time yeah. to come back and, and review again. And but look at the list. I, it's the, the tittle seemed ambitious enough uh, <laughs> already, but good for Anna for, you know, adding to the tittle. Adam Anna made it happen and having that artificial deadline will provide a little extra focus on getting your project list done. You're going to have it in the back of the head, like, the six month check-in is coming and it's going to help you focus on some of the stuff. So that's great. I, I have to say, I really love the description for category four, the, what was I thinking category? <laughs> How many projects have we looked at later and thought, what was I thinking when I was doing that? So great for you to pick two that fall in that category and send them on. Um, you really embrace the concept of the tittle and it seems like you made some good progress. So congratulations on that. I think a lot of um, a lot of unfinished projects are sort of habits of thinking. Mm. You know, we put something on the list, and then every time we review the list, there it is. If if we you know, have oh, a yeah, written yeah, list, or that one. or maybe it just bounces around in the back of your head, and it's important to revisit habits of thought to say, wait, is this really still something I want to do or could I let it go? That's what the, is it still that, necessary? That's what, yeah. That's what the, what was I thinking made me think of the project that I, uh, that springs to mind when I do this with a client, it's an old, old one it happened many years ago. We were working in an office and we were sorting papers and we found a file that had like five years of electricity bills in it. And I said, okay, so these are really old electricity bills. There's five years. You don't really need them for anything. You're not deducting on your tax return. And, you know, can we shred these? Oh, no, no, no. Well, why not? Because I'm going to make a spreadsheet of my electrical costs for the last five years. So I can see how much, you know, how, how, I can see the pricing, how the pricing has changed over time. Okay, so 
have you done that spreadsheet? Have you started the spreadsheet? No. And the end goal is for you to find out how much money you spent or what the pricing was over time. And you can't change the pricing, right? And no, and you can't use the spreadsheet to negotiate pricing in the future, right? No. So all you're really doing is you're going to make a spreadsheet to, um, you know, make yourself feel bad about your cost of electricity. <laughs> <laughs> I want to torture myself seeing how how much the price has gone up. Right. Like, what is the point of this spreadsheet and why why do you think it's a project you need to do? And after a lot, like we had to talk about it for 20 minutes, but after the 20 minutes, it was sort of like, oh, well, yeah, <laughs> there, it isn't going to get me any useful data if I do this. And therefore I can let it go. But I really had to talk her through all of the reasons why she thought she needed to spreadsheet that electrical bill list of five years. It's like, you can't go back and change it. The electricity has already been spent. The bills have already been paid. There's nothing you can do about old stuff. And, and the electric company is going to charge you what they charge you. They're not going to care that you have an average that you're willing to pay. <laughs> They're just going to charge you what they charge. So you know, it was a very interesting conversation to have. And a perfect example of she had been hanging onto that paper and she had that list, uh, that project in her head for five years and never let it come to the top. Yeah, I made it go away. <laughs> we we declared it a number four and moved on. <laughs> Dawn reports, I made a list of my artistic projects, their status and what the next step is for each of them. Ooh, that's a good list. So you know how much you have out there, all your projects in process, and you can um, you can go and be inspired by the ones that you need to keep working on instead of trying to add new ones. Because you probably have a long list, right? You have a whole, but all creative people have a huge list of projects that are always in the middle of being done. So knowing what they are and circling back to them, good job. Linda in Pennsylvania said, I'm putting expiration dates on projects. If Ooh. not by, if not done by then, it's a sign that it is not going to happen. That's a great idea. I like that. I like that. And if you get to the deadline and you still can't let it go, then you have to have a whole nother, like, we have to reevaluate this. Why do I think I'm doing it? What do I think it's going to accomplish? Why do I feel uncomfortable about letting it go? So good job. Again, artificial deadlines, right? Make a deadline. If it's not done, you got to, you got to seriously consider letting it go. <clears throat> good for you Anya reports I did some decluttering subscriptions and got rid of one that cost me 35 euros each month oh uh, she said each month I'm wondering if she left left a number out if that I don't or if that's really every month in any case you know that's plenty that's plenty of money to save even if it's every three months or six months yeah yay freedom I ordered some yummy food today instead <laughs> I love it. That is your reward for decluttering and shutting something down. Excellent. Good job. Oh, and here's one. It's This is not maybe not a report on last week's tittle, but uh, very relevant to the upcoming discussion. Eclair says, I'm collecting even more stuff from closet, bookshelves, CDs, videos, shoes, etc. Have a big pile at front door to go to donations tomorrow. Husband is now getting on board. Woohoo! We love that. Sometimes you just have to model the behavior you want to get everybody in on it, right? Excellent. Oh, okay. So don't make the pile so big that you can't get it out the door. You, <laughs> uh, you know, you absolutely want to go get it in the car. You don't want to live with that pile by the door. So part of your project here is that it actually has to leave the house and, and stay focused. Linda, who had the house fire some months ago, said we will be building a thousand square foot space that is aging friendly despite all the stuff we got rid of post fire i know i'll have to sort out what can should fit into the new space and finding homes for the family pieces that don't make the cut um she also said not sure what projects made it post fire but i want to enter into the season of sorting the salvage stuff out with the mindset that i will complete this project rather than this sounds like fun Yes, yes. That's a that's a much better and more more narrow uh, and, and immediate, right? It, it yeah. must have a very immediate purpose if you can commit to I will get it done. And I would say that while they're building the house, you might go through the stuff that's been salvaged and you can probably do the first pass right now of I know this piece of furniture won't fit anywhere. 
and you can start um, while they're doing their work, you can start thinning the herd a little bit um, and removing things that are obviously not going to work, finding, you know, piles of paper and going through those that in, if anything got saved, you know, that kind of stuff, starting the cleaning process, because I imagine that they have um, smoke or ash, some of the stuff needs to be cleaned. And so you can slowly start that process, which will allow you to start touching the things in the storage unit and be thinking in the back of your mind, does this make sense in the new house or not? And some of them, it'll have to wait until you have the space to see how it works. But some of them will be very obviously, yeah, I don't really care about that. I don't need that to go in the house or this is not going to fit. It's not going to work. I need something better, smaller, different uh, now than I did before. And so this is my intersection to let it go. Good luck with that. Keep keep us up to date. Keep telling us how it's going. Deborah says, crafting is always my fantasy life. Fortunately, I have divested myself of unfinished projects and only have soap making stuff around, uh -huh. but just got another idea for soap making and for Christmas. Went down the Christmas rabbit hole on Pinterest today, so now have another project. <laughs> there's a That's theme okay. Of, there's a rabbit hole theme in the chat right now. Ginger said, I so understand the lady with the five years of electric bills and the spreadsheet. I've had to let those projects go. I'm a curious type that can chase rabbits down holes. <laughs> right? Uh, I, I totally understand. Uh, it, it, curiosity takes me away from what I have meant to be doing so many, many, times, many times every single day. And we are, you know, data junkies, spreadsheet junkies. Like we totally get the whole oh, yeah. thrill of the spreadsheet. But, you know, if it's a spreadsheet that is not going to do you any good once it's done, then you probably need to move on to a different spreadsheet that's actually going to be helpful. <laughs> well, and I would never discourage anybody from following their own curiosity because you discover all sorts of interesting things da going down rabbit holes. Sure, sure. She said, I stick to comparing, Ginger said, I stick to comparing this year to last year in my budget book. It's like a little hobby. Judge me if you wish. We no, do not. We absolutely do not. <laughs> <laughs> and the truth is the better spreadsheet for my client would have been, um, you know, if she's concerned about competitive pricing for electricity to do a spreadsheet comparing company options and all the various companies and what plans they have and, and the pricing that she can get from various people. That would have made sense to me. I'm making a spreadsheet to help me make an informed decision about what my new electric company and plan is going to be. Um, but the, but the retroactive look at the old electric bills was just designed to make her feel bad so it's like yeah that, that that's is there's a better plan here there's a better spreadsheet there's always a better spreadsheet so <laughs> make sure you're doing the one that makes sense and is going to be helpful deborah <laughs> says occasionally i put sticky notes on the edge of my laptop to remind myself of what i went to the internet for otherwise ooh, shiny <laughs> I want to know if there is a word, true. someone please tell me if there is a word for the phenomenon when you pick up your phone to get one particular piece of information and then you're distracted by something else and then you put your phone down and minutes later you remember, oh yeah, I was going to oh. check the weather <laughs> tomorrow or I was going to reply to an email or a text from so-and-so or whatever. <laughs> there, there needs to be a, a word for that. Because Those I, stupid notifications, it's always the notifications. Like you go in with a thought in your head and then you see some notification and you're off, right? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, I missed a call. Uh, what was this? Yeah, I'm yeah. so bad about that. I really do that probably. Deborah says ADHD you know. is the word. <laughs> oh, I, oh. <laughs> I just, I wanted a more narrow, like a verb. They, someone just needs to invent a new verb for right. the act of picking up your phone to do one thing and then doing something else and, and forgetting the first thing. Yeah, being derailed. <laughs> okay, oh, I think we, funny should, today. we probably need to move Hit the on road. Okay. before we go down any more rabbit holes. <laughs> we should probably get to our main topic of conversation. Yeah, you guys are watching Ed and I have a typical meeting right now. <laughs> right watch us spiral okay so here we funny. go on the main topic do the people with whom you share your space complicate your decluttering process spouses <laughs> partners housemates little children big children adult children 
and elderly parents with conflicting or non-existent household habits and routines can sabotage our efforts to get organized. And sometimes even those who live alone aren't free from outside meddling in our spaces. Today, we're going to discuss how to work with or around the other people who contribute to clutter in our homes. So let's start by sharing a few survey results. In response to our question about who shares responsibility for the creation or accumulation of clutter, more than half of our respondents, 56%, said that they themselves bear most or all the responsibility, followed by their spouse or partner at 25% and adult children at 9%. And I have to say, um, I don't buy that statistic. <laughs> I think that's a ref the 56% that said it's all my fault. I think that's partially a reflection of being blamed by the people in your environment. So I, I see through you. <laughs> I know you feel bad about it, but I think that it's not always just you. There's always more than one person participating, and there's just usually one person that barks more and one person that's willing to take the blame more. And so, yeah, that's what I'm saying. <laughs> so a few of our audience members laid blame on employers or workplace conditions that require them to keep some materials used for work at home, which and one of my good friends does that. She's um, a salesperson, and she has to take product and so she's always got boxes of product stuff that she's got to take out to clients and yeah it's a nightmare this is a particularly a project for a problem for teachers though who share classrooms instead of having their own dedicated spaces and so they have all sort of their teacher materials at home another um, uh, manufactured uh, problem from having doing classrooms from on zoom from covid <clears throat> right Several respondents mentioned deceased spouses, parents, or other relatives at sources of a clutter problem. See this all the time. The death of a loved one can create a large influx of clutter or leave behind a stash, a house full that's suddenly your responsibility. 31% of our audience said that their pets share some responsibility for the clutter. One respondent said that her cat bears all the responsibility for clutter issues in their home, but admitted that the problem might be overly indulgent human beings. Yeah, I thought about suggesting, I thought about suggesting some sort of intervention on that one. If your cat is responsible for all of your clutter, uh, then yeah. You may 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 need to reevaluate your pet parenting skills <laughs> i just thought that was so hilarious like yeah we're just gonna throw the pets under the bus and right. blame it all on them <laughs> on the flip side in answer to our question about who shares active and regular responsibility in decluttering and organize we were disappointed but not surprised to see that our audience members themselves are shouldering most or all the load about 90 percent of the time about 45% said that their spouse or partner shares a little responsibility, and only 10% said that their spouse or partner shares a lot or most of the responsibility. And, and I have to say, this reflects my experience that one person in the partnership who reaches their threshold of distress around clutter first ultimately ends up being the person taking on the job regularly out of self-preservation and desire to not be stressed about it. And then somehow it becomes it, de facto their assigned job. And, and the other person never really gets enrolled in participating. And I think that that's, um, it's a default setting and it's a communication failure that, that needs attention so that you don't have to be the only person doing it. And yeah, maybe they don't like it, but if they want to stay married and happy, they should be participating. <laughs> so <laughs> that's, you know, I, ha I have lots of things to say about that. <clears throat> so I want to read a few uh, survey responses that highlight where the clutter disconnects arise in a lot of the household. And Linda sent this comment to us. I handle most paperwork, all filed away unless I'm actively paying bills and doing the taxes, taxes, et cetera. My husband does some paperwork, which relates to him specifically. His preferred storage solution is paper spread out to cover the largest horizontal surface possible, which is the dining room table. So we've arranged that he can only spread out over half of it. This stuff remains there all the time, except when I very carefully slide it over to the other half of the table to facilitate cleaning the table. I don't love this compromise, but I do love him. <laughs> 
Oh, my. okay. So this one made me say, oh, darn. I'm not sure it's much of a compromise at this point. I guess there's not another table available for this besides the dining table. Um, I know what this looks like and people who need to see it, and I'm doing that in air quotes for the podcast, um, who need to see it don't actually see all of it, but they create this mental picture map of the laid out papers and they remember something was on the left side at the back. And it's a very difficult layout to live with when half the dining table is covered all the time. So is there any chance that he could have a portable table in another room or some stand up file holders on the table that are easier to move? And what I'm thinking of is those uh, wire racks that or a metal rack that think, you know, file folders can stand up in on top of the table. And, and then I have questions about his paperwork. Like, is everything on the table all active? Is it things that he needs to do or is he? really filing paper that way in his head like is he creating file piles that he's just saving the paper so he knows where it is um you might add some stacking in trays uh you know like an inbox tray that goes up and it would be a way to go a little bit vertical and maybe make it easier to clean the table may make it easier for you to slide the stuff back and forth to clean the table I mean, basically, I get that he is visually oriented in that way. And so he's he's trying to lay it out so that he is reminded where things are and he can put his hands on it because he's laid that mental map out. Um, but there's probably some more compromise there, depending on what kinds of paper he's parking there. If he's just filing that way, then maybe we can file in a vertical rack or an in tray um, and get some of the filing off the table and then leave, leave him... On, with the stuff laid out that's his to-do items, his action list, his, you know, I need to follow up on this pile and make sure that it doesn't have projects that he needs that's on his project list. And it's been on the project list for five years. Like make sure that some of that stuff is relatively current is what I'm saying and, yeah. and not aging in place for a decade. If you encountered this situation, it would definitely be worth digging into what exactly are we talking about? If he has a few bills that he pays every month that are still that are his responsibility where you haven't combined your finances, then set it up in a, you know, in a bill paying station that could be one of those monthly and, you know, monthly sorters. What do you call those Mm -hmm, things? You know, mm -hmm. the the, yeah, yeah. A file box uh, that has has the 31 days or whatever. If it's long term record keeping, well, the dining room table definitely does not seem like the place. Right. So and 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 he may be, you know, people that are visually oriented like that, out of out of mind, whatever. But you could help him talk through what it is he's trying to save and make a space for him and help him file those things so that even if he forgets once the file drawer is closed, if he forgets what's in there, you might remember what's in there and be able to orient him when he's going to look for something. Um, but at, you do want to make sure that there is just not a bunch of filing on the table, that it's actually things that he wants to do. And, you know, he's going to resist because he prefers to have it all spread out. And I get that. And so I guess I'm just saying that you're it, it, the compromise is that you're surrendering the dining table to be a desk. And there might be ways to make that easier for you to maneuver, easier for you to take it off and for him to still have the things laid out at some level. There's more compromise to be had there. <clears throat> okay. So Mo shared this response. My husband continues to jokingly threaten to get a roll off dumpster and just toss everything in our basement. At one point, he put our children's crib out for our monthly bulk pickup. And I tearfully dragged it back in the house. <laughs> it's like, oh, okay. So the husband is being practical here. And the wife is being emotionally attached to an object around her children. I would say anything that's kid related needs the courtesy of a conversation before it's removed. You know, somebody in that house is attached to that kid stuff and that's why it's not already out in the trash. She needs to acknowledge her. He needs to acknowledge her attachment and discuss it with her. She needs to recognize that the crib is not in use and it's a huge piece of furniture that's doing no one any good rotting away in the garage. So take a picture of it and donate it so it can be of use to someone. Um, And I also have to say threatening to dump it all isn't a whole, it's not a really good joke. It's um, anxiety producing for the person in the house that is not making the joke. And when someone in the house believes that there are important things in there, 
joking that it's all going to get dumped in the trash is very distressing. <clears throat> and he's having an emotional response to his own, his own overwhelm about the garage by saying, let's throw it out. And she's having her emotional response to overwhelm by saying, let's keep it all. So this couple needs to make a plan to tackle the garage in sections only, not the whole garage, and to do it slowly over time and to do it together. I'm guessing the garage isn't usable currently and he's wanting access to the space again. And this is always, there's always stuff to let go of, even if the crib stays, but everybody needs to be out there to go through things and not force yourself to keep working all through the whole day. Um, it needs to be a project that is smaller in duration and then repeated more often because the longer and the more tired you get, the more the husband's just going to say, throw it out. And the more the wife's going to say, forget it. And you, you know, it's going to deteriorate quickly from there. So I would say it's reasonable if there's a crib in the garage, that there's probably a lot of stuff in the garage and it, it's crowded and it's a reasonable thing that he wants it cleared up. And he's expressing his desire for it to change by threatening to throw it all in the dumpster. And, and, and we don't want that actual outcome. That is not a good outcome for anybody. Nobody's going to survive that and be happy. So <laughs> the better solution is for you guys to tackle it a little bit at a time, you know, divide it up in qu quarters and do one quarter at a time. And then everybody's through. And by then they're probably all triggered and irritated and you can stop and come back another day and do some more. There's always things to take off the top. And so yeah, rewrite that plan and recognize that he's threatening it because he is distressed. He is overwhelmed. He is irritated. He he is saying to you, I have a problem with this and I need to do something about it. And let's make a plan that doesn't terrorize the wife, but actually addresses his need to clean this garage up. So you guys figure out how to do it together in a way that doesn't it isn't throwing it all in a dumpster because that's never a good solution for anybody. Okay. There's that. And then we have audience member, Sandra, who said, I gave our daughter one of my favorite cookbooks after she got married. My husband who had never used the cookbook and didn't prepare meals or bake was cross about me giving it away. And he still brings it up many years later. This to me is, I mean, he's describing to you, an emotional attachment and he is saying to you that he has he feels an injury if he brings it up many years later he feels injured by you letting it go and so i guess the question is i i would want to have a conversation with him about why that particular book book cookbook was so important to him clearly if he didn't use the cookbook and he's not a cook it wasn't about the practicality of whether he used the cookbook or not. So he's attached some other meaning to the cookbook and I would want to find out what that is. So what, how did he feel attached to the cookbook? And then what did he feel about? Why did he feel the stress that it went to your daughter and find out what he, what his feelings are about it? What happened? Yeah. It might just need oh, what's the it, source it, of the attachment. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and it may just be that you have to say, I didn't realize you felt that way. And I'm really, really sorry. And it is, at least it is with our daughter and it's still in the family. And, you know, if you don't want to listen to him, bring it up continuously for the next decade, you might want to try to have this conversation and explore what happened, why it was important to him, because clearly there's some memory or attachment that he has about it that you don't realize. And so chase it down and find out, clear it up. Okay. <clears throat> so in answer to our question about a behavior change we'd like to see in someone else, one anonymous respondent said, ask before tossing a hundred percent. I guess one of the hard things is that people don't know how attaching someone, how attached someone is to something without asking. I will give the same respect of asking and not assuming that just because I don't think it's valuable, doesn't mean anyone else automatically feels the same way as I do. So you have just described the clutter fairy functioning right there. <laughs> like when I go and work with someone, I have no idea what piece of paper is important to them or reminds them of somebody or 
what I think is trash is not trash. Ginger said on the subject of the cookbook, it's probably not about the cookbook. It's about being included in the decision to give it away. Mm, right. And somehow the fact that it went to their daughter is not sufficient. Was not enough. What, yeah. Was not enough. And so clearly there was more conversation to be had there. So balancing the needs of everyone in the household so they feel that their needs are being addressed is a constant learning game. If you live alone, then you could set all the priorities and agendas. But if you live with someone else, you're sharing an environment that affects everybody that lives there. Deciding what creates the most effect for all who live there means you have to be in discussion with them regularly about it. It requires master negotiation skills to find the changes that work the best for all. So first and foremost, let's talk about spouses or long-term partners. My clients tend to be mostly women. So what I hear the most about in my work is the issues women experience in managing clutter with, or sometimes in conflict with their husband. Um, scenario number one, he's neat, she's the clutter one, and he pressures her about it all the time. Scenario two, he has clutter, she's more organized, and she has difficulty getting his buy-in for her organizing goals. And scenario three, anything in between. He's neat, except for his one collection that is a problem for everybody. He's easy going, except for his pet clutter pee. She's very organized and she's married a chronically disorganized person. So each of those scenarios creates their own um, clutter management issues. <laughs> Here's an example of a client couple with this tension in their marriage. And we're going to nickname them Sarah and Ben. Uh, these two adults both have ADD tendencies and they have three boys. As so you can imagine, their house is always chaotic and drowning in stuff. There's always toys in motion in that house constantly. Uh, Sarah has a hard time focusing herself. And so she can't keep ahead of her kids. Ben is also a clutter bug, but, th but with some very specific pet peeves. Like he wants the dining room chairs lined up perfectly with the table. He doesn't see the chaos on the top of the table, but the chair positions make him crazy every night when he comes home from work. So this is an example of when I realized that I asked him what about this room bothered him. And he said, like, and I'm looking at a room that's covered in a sea of stuff on the floor, on all the counters, on top of the table, everything. There's chaos everywhere. And the thing that he was worried about was the fact that the chairs were not lined up with the table. And he noticed it every night when he came home and it made him crazy every night. Like it really torqued him in some way that was not comprehensible to me. I never would have guessed that on my own. I would have never looked at the sea that I was looking at and, and thought he's going to complain about where the chairs are. <laughs> never. Right. But it was, <clears throat> he left the room and I turned to her and I said, oh my God. Five minutes before he comes home from work, you can straighten up the chairs and he will be happy as a clam when he comes home. It will not matter what the rest of the house looks like. All you got to do is go straighten the chairs. Well, like, and that may be that, you know, he's a little obsessive compulsive. Well, he's and, an engineer. Right. And that he recognizes the difficulty of the larger problem, mm. but he doesn't understand why this little thing that can be done in a minute doesn't get you know isn't done doesn't get done right and, and and probably doesn't understand why it doesn't bother anyone else doesn't bother her why no bother one else you. notices it right 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 yeah mm -hmm. and it, it it was just it was such a revelation to me it's like if you had quizzed me i would never have guessed that but it was so easy to figure out oh my gosh you don't have to worry about the, what's the stuff on like like come come at five minutes before he comes home and go straighten the chairs up and you will have a happy husband when he comes in the house he will be swimming through a sea of stuff and he will see the chairs in place and he will be happy when he comes home like that is the easiest thing to fix ever i've never had it so good and so you know i don't know whether she's kept that up or how that worked for her in the end but Man, I would have certainly been making sure the chairs were straight all the time so that he was not tweaking about that. I feel and his it, pain it, be, because <laughs> when I walk into somebody else's house and kitchen cabinet doors are standing open, I'm like, <laughs> how can you live this way? I can ignore <laughs> I can ignore a whole lot of other things, but kitchen cabinet doors standing open. Part of that is I'm tall, and so it's really easy to hit my head on things. Right. But uh, 
that happens in my clients a lot though. I show up and I just sort of walk in the kitchen and start closing cabinet doors because they're <laughs> open. And I do it without even thinking about it. It's like, oh, these are open again. But it but it is a function of it's it's a sign of somebody who's ADD and easily distracted. Like they get the cup out and that's all they care about that's and they as go far on. As they get. Right. Yeah. And so yeah. <laughs> oh, okay. So um another relationship in the house is minor children. So in response to the question in our survey about things that other household members regard as treasure, but we see as clutter, audience member Sarah said, my kids have toys, books, and clothes that they have completely outgrown. I do not have room in my home for a museum of their childhood. Every item can't be a keepsake. And the issue is you signed up for kids. So you're going to have to live with a certain amount of clutter. However, enrolling them early in the chores they have to do to participate in the household is vital. The sooner you start them on their part of your shared space, is the better. And if one more kid tells me that's what the maid is for, I'm going to scream. <laughs> I, had a, uh, I had a teenager tell me that in a, when I was speaking to a group once. That's what the maid is for. And I just wanted to run over there and choke her out. <laughs> I just could not believe she said that. Uh, but little kids, of course, are better able to do, they want to do what mom says, they want to do what dad says, and you can enroll them in the process of let's go, you know, let's go put that thing back, let's go put that thing up, let's put the dish in wherever, that kind of stuff. And the idea of every item can't be a keepsake, and this is mom's, this is mom's issues, the issue for moms everywhere is what I'm trying to say here. All moms see everything that their kids touched in their childhood as precious and lovely. And you can't keep a museum <laughs> to their childhood in your house. And it was only going to die in the attic or the basement or the guest closet or wherever you stash it. It's only going to be hidden and deteriorate and be useless. And so creating a practice for circling through that stuff and choosing the best representative samples. These are perfect collections for choosing the representative sample of the books that they loved, you know, keep their three favorite books and pass the rest of the books on to some kid that needs to have them now is the way that you don't enshrine everything that they touch in your house as a keepsake. What about adult children who've returned to the nest? So <clears throat> The issue is they've tasted some independence, so they don't want to be treated like children anymore. But the temptation to let mom and dad start taking back some of the adult responsibilities is hard to resist. Home is your safe space to be a kid. And I remember very well being that being that adult and going to mother's house and being like, oh, thank God, mother's cooking breakfast. <laughs> so defining new boundaries is up to the parent. And parents love having the kids home most of the time. And so falling into the old routines of caretaking is so easy to revert to. Everybody has to agree that we're all adults now and we're all going to participate in the care of our shared space. The issue with elderly parents is that they've surrendered some independence because of their health, their capacities, or their needs have changed, but they still need to feel like they're complete members of the household with rights to privacy, respect, and valued input on decisions to be made. Elder care has a huge impact impact on a family space and requires careful negotiation between elder and adult kids to make it work. Issues with housemates and roommates and house guests and people outside of your house that add, that add to the clutter, like um, your parents or your older relatives, uh, they start giving you stuff. <laughs> like they get in their mind that they need to start divesting themselves. And so they start telling you to take things home when you visit, or they start mailing you things, or they start um, calling you and saying you need to come and get this. <laughs> so um, it, they those people are trying to get rid of their clutter and it makes them feel better to give them to relatives. And sometimes it's a better strategy to just take it and then deal with it on the back end the way that it should have been dealt with. So there's some yeah. general strategies for many kinds of relationships. All of them can, um, can deal with this. Um, you want to find the common ground here as you work on these organizing projects. Establish the goals on which you both agree. You guys may have different organizing styles and you may have different things that you want to work on or things that bother you. And so when you are trying to negotiate um, a compromise and working together, you want to work towards goals that you both agree need to get done. 
Yes, we need to clean out the garage. Yes, we need to fix the patio. Yes, we need our closet closet to function better. If everybody, if both of you agree on the project, you're more likely to find, um, to be able to work on it together. Recognize the need for compromise, especially if you have really different organizing styles. One super organized, not so organized. There's a lot of room in between there and um, everybody's going to have to compromise. And not just the person that likes it organized, you're going to have to accept a slightly less organized version of your life. But the other person is going to have to accept a slightly more organized version of their life. And everybody has to meet in the middle, right? On the subject of, of styles, uh, Naomi shared a great comment. She said, even if both people are organized, maybe their organiz organizing styles clash. My mm -hmm. late husband wanted to put labels on the outside of kitchen cabinets so even visitors would know what to put away where. I wouldn't let him because to me, labels are visual chaos. Part of your negotiation needs to be talking honestly about your thresholds and limits. You know, I this, here's something I, that I just can't stand. This is fingernails on a chalkboard for me. Right, so right, could, right. Could we please not do this? And the compromise for mm. that situation you just described would have been putting the labels on the shelves behind the cabinet doors. So that you didn't have to see the labels when you're standing in the kitchen, but you could still open the cabinet and see labels. And, and that would have been a compromise that might have worked between the two of you. You want to identify specific areas on which each of you can concentrate your effort. So there's probably everybody has different things that they do well and don't do well. And so um, claiming those areas that you feel like you have the wherewithal to face or the skill set to work on um, will help you allocate some of the work in the house, like let everybody work on what, what they're good at. Have conversations before anybody reaches a boiling point. Once, if, once somebody is screaming or angry or upset or crying, um, it becomes much harder to have a productive conversation. So you guys want to have honest conversations about what's bothering you, what's getting in the way, what doesn't work. Um, what you want to get done, what would make you feel better, what would make you happy in the space. You want to have those conversations from a, in, in a neutral moment before you get angry, before somebody loses their mind, before <laughs> the screaming starts. <clears throat> Respect boundaries. People are going to set boundaries around stuff. And uh, once you negotiate that position and, and negotiate what the assigned projects are, what areas need to be worked on, um, what things are pet peeves, what things need to get done in order to be happy, then you want to respect the boundaries that you, you negotiate. So don't agree to something and then not follow through. And avoid the language of blame and shame. Don't accuse anybody of acting badly. You want to talk instead about specific behaviors and the problems or the bad feelings that have resulted from the specific behaviors. Once you start telling somebody you're doing it bad, you're doing it wrong, I'm mad at you, you know, it's all your fault, you, you, you've tossed negotiation out the window. So you really want to be very careful and neutral about the conversation and talk about, you know, if, they, if they'd had that conversation about the chairs without me, then it would have been helpful for him to say, it, it's one of my pet peeves that the chairs aren't aligned. Could you please help me by managing those chairs more regularly. Leela suggested, I, I'd say use questions rather than statements and be as polite as possible. Mm -hmm. Start your sentences with words like, I feel like, or other phrases that the other person cannot get so easily offended or argue with. Yes. Yes. This is the, this is the perfect time exactly to be as neutral as possible. Um, because if you've been arguing about clutter already, and you guys are at the place where you're um, have years of of discontent and distress around organizing. Um, you've got a lot of old tapes running in your head about we've had this conversation before and it always ends this way. So the way that you don't go down that path is that you are very polite and very neutral, and everyone agrees to be very neutral around the conversation. And Notice when you start getting distressed or saying things that you always say, when you default to saying the stuff that you always say, it's time to go. Okay, we got to stop this conversation. Now we're not being, um, 
we've slipped off into being into old stuff instead of being trying to address it new. It will be hard because you have years of, of doing it the old way and, and it takes a lot to change the steering of the boat, but it can be done. And like she said, as neutral as possible, as polite as possible, questions instead of statements will make a huge difference in terms of riding the ship. I think it also might help to get some buy-in from the partner, spouse, or housemate. If you say, if you couch your the discussion in terms of, here's something I would like that I can't do right now or can't have right now, it would be really nice. I, I would love to be able to work on this project of mine, but this clutter that we share is part of is standing in my way mm -hmm. so they understand your motivation they understand that something important to you is at stake yeah and that and that that makes this particular pile of clutter a priority versus something else we mm -hmm. are running out of time i know we have we had lots more prepared oh gosh, to, should, prepared yeah. to say and we'll just save it for a sequel okay. because <laughs> we need to talk about next week Yes. We will be back next week, Tuesday, November 22nd at the usual time, noon U.S. Central Time, live in Zoom and streaming on Facebook. It will be uh, Thanksgiving week in the, in the United States. There's going to be a little gratitude-related tittle for you. Just as trees drop their leaves to rest and wait for spring, the end of the year is a good time for us to pause and shed things from our lives to make room for something new to reflect on what has served its purpose, what no longer fits, which habits have changed, what we're ready to sell, donate, recycle, discard. In our next episode, we'll discuss taking a personal inventory focused on clearing space for wonderful new things in 2023. Join us on November 22nd for A Season for Edits. Make space for the 2023 version of your life. Ta-da! That will be fun. That'll be a good one. Why don't you give us a tittle? Okay, here's the tittle. All hands on deck. This week's assignment is to engage another member of your family or household in an organizing task or project. As you discuss the task or the area in question, set aside blame, judgment, and any history you may have with the project. Focus instead on things on which you can agree and on constructive ways to move forward, such as improving your communication around stuff, how you use your home and your shared roles in caring for the space, learning more about and accommodating an, uh, one another's different tastes, habits, and organizing styles. Super important to ask those questions. How is it different? How do you like to do it? What would be better for you? Clearly communicating your needs and desires around clutter and organizing to the family member or housemate in, in question. So you want to be explaining to them this is what would make me happy. This is what I, this is what I'm hoping for. You can't get what you don't want, it, what you want if you don't ask for it. Um, and you want to negotiate specific solutions to address the most troubling areas, the things that bother each of you the most. And I promise you that you will be stunned to, to understand what your um, spouse, housemate, uh, family member finds the most bothersome in the house. You will think you know what it is, and then you will ask them, and they will say something completely different, and you will be stunned and surprised. So um, it's super important to ask what those are and focus on the ones that annoy everybody the most first because you're going to get the biggest bang for the buck out of it. So let's go um, you know, get clear with our family members and see if we can communicate better and accommodate their tastes and address the stuff that's bothering them the most and get a little bit more peace in the household. That's what we're aiming for. <laughs> uh, I'm going to wrap up with this um, comment from Leela who says, everyone has qualities we do and don't like. Got to love them anyway and focus on the good points. Exactly. That's exactly right. A compromise can be had and you love them for a reason. So um, good luck with the tittle and good luck with this project. And I think we are out for the week. If you're watching this on YouTube, we'd love for you to join us live. To get notifications about upcoming events, we invite you to join the meetup group by visiting cfhou.com slash meetup. You can also follow us on Facebook by visiting cfhou.com slash Facebook. 
or join our mailing list by visiting cfhou.com slash subscribe. We love to hear from you, so please send, your, send us your questions, comments, and topic suggestions in the YouTube comments on Facebook or anywhere else that you find us. You can always reach us through our website at clutterfairhouston.com. Thanks for coming, everybody. We're glad to see you again, and we will see you next week. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.